So I look at my own portfolio and I own a lot of real estate. I own some Bitcoin. I have some stocks. I have cash. I have some gold and silver and precious metals, platinum, palladium, all that stuff. You know, I have a mix of all these things, right? And I think, gosh, I'm long on everything. Should I be worried about that? Should I be shorting something? I mean, I'm basically expecting the value of all those things in my portfolio to increase. But I am big time short on one thing, and that's the US dollar. And I'm going to talk to you today about how I short the dollar and how you can too. Thanks for having me back again. I love talking to your students and your audience. You just have done such a good job for so many years, just teaching people how to invest the right way prudently, you know, the, the things that actually work in the real world. So it, it's always great to talk to your group. What I'd like to focus on today is an issue that really harms most people. It's actually quite terrible. But as real estate investors, buying income properties, you can benefit from it in a big, big way. So it's a double-edged sword. Most people are hurt by this, but I'm going to teach you today how to make it your best friend, this particular topic. So let me go ahead and share my screen here. That's our friend Joe Biden and his Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen, who used to be heading up the Federal Reserve. Uh, we still got Jerome Powell doing that job. But what are they doing? What are they doing here? Well, they are creating money out of thin air and they are spending it. Our late president, Ronald Reagan, many years ago, used to have this saying, he said, to say that the government spends money like a drunken sailor is an insult to drunken sailors. <laughs> and I, I love that quote uh, because it is really so true. And what does that really mean to us? What does it mean? Okay, so what? The government spends a lot of money. We all know that, right? No surprise there. But what does it do? What does it mean to us? Well, what it really means is inflation, inflationary pressure. When the government spends money, they get into a position where they create inflation, where prices rise both asset prices and consumer prices. And as these prices rise, most people in the world get very, very hurt by this. But real estate investors are in a very special position. Now, if you think I'm going to talk about this basic idea of, you know, you've probably heard this before. Well, real estate is a good hedge against inflation. It goes way beyond that. This is going to be unique to almost everybody. It is a strategy I developed about 18 years ago. I've been teaching it for 18 years. And when people hear it, when they see it, they are really quite amazed by it. And it's really the hidden wealth creator in the real estate investing game. A lot of people don't understand this correctly. They don't see how it's benefiting them in so, so many ways. And we're going to go into that today. And we're going to look at a specific example not a theory, a specific example of how this benefited tens of millions of people in the past, uh, really maybe hundreds of millions of people. I don't have exact numbers on that, but it's a lot. It's a lot of people. So I think we can all agree that the government spends too much money. Why do they do that? Well, there's a myriad of reasons. They do it mostly to buy votes. Politicians love to stay in power. And to stay in power, they've got to give out the goodies. They've got to be Santa Claus. They've got to just, you know, distribute goodies to people. And so they always promise more and more. And all of this stuff has a big, big hidden cost. Most people don't see that, but it really comes to affect them later. With real estate investors, though, they can benefit from this if they align their interest with the two most powerful forces the world has ever known. What are they? Those two most powerful forces the world has ever known. Governments and central banks. And governments and central banks are playing by a game plan, a business plan. This is all planned and it all benefits them. 
And we can sit here as, as long as you want, and we can complain about it, we can grouse about it, we can say it's wrong, and that would be true. It is wrong. What they're doing is wrong. It's not fair. But life isn't fair. What we need to do as investors is we need to align our interest with these two most powerful forces humanity has ever known, governments and central banks. And so I'm going to show you specifically how to do that today during the time I have. Let's go ahead and dive in and take a look at this. So this is no secret to anybody, but a lot of people don't really know how to think about it, right? They don't really understand what does this really mean? Well, since the Federal Reserve was created back in 1913, just over 100 years ago, and that is our country's central bank, the value of the dollar has lost about 96 or 97 cents. So a dollar back then was worth a lot more than a dollar is now. Most people, again, have been very, very hurt by this. And every time there's another big event like 9-11, when there's the Great Recession, and then when there's a COVID pandemic, whenever we have one of these events, the government just spends more and more and debases the value of our dollars more and more. So hurts most people, helps real estate investors. Last time I was here, I believe I talked to you about my new index, the Hartman Comparison Index or the HCI. We won't have time to dive into that today, but what I did talk about before is how real estate, believe it or not, is actually still quite cheap nowadays. A lot of people are worried about a bubble because they're making a fatal mistake. And that fatal mistake in their interpretations is that they're only comparing the price of real estate, the price of housing, to one thing. What is that one thing? Dollars. And dollars have lost a lot of value. So the real question is, has the price of that house gone up or has the value of what you're trading for it, the dollar, gone down? And both of these things are true, but what the Hartman Comparison Index does is it helps people value real estate by comparing it to a whole giant basket of things, over 40 commodities and services that everybody on earth uses pretty much every day. And when you compare the price of housing to all these other commodities and all these other services, it really shows us that housing is actually historically cheap, even now. And I know a lot of people might be out there saying, Jason, are you kidding me? Houses are $350,000. You know, that's about the median price house nowadays. It seems so expensive. They're higher than they were before the Great Recession. You know, back in, in 2005, 2006, we've already passed that prior peak. So what? If you price them in a whole bunch of things like oil, gold, rice, rice is the food stock for two thirds of the world's population. Gold has been considered money for 5,000 years. And I'm not a gold bug. I like real estate, of course. But when you compare it to all these other things, oil, oil basically runs the world. It doesn't matter what Tesla or all the environmentalists say, oil is arguably the most important commodity to the entire human race. It runs the world, right? When you compare the price of housing to these things, it's historically quite cheap, believe it or not. So that's why we see this market continuing. And I know just since I talked to you last time, it's taken a little bit of a breather, just a, a minor breather in terms of activity, has slowed a bit and we'll see where that goes. But the Hartman Comparison Index can really help people understand the real value of real estate compared to a whole bunch of other things. Okay, so again, that was last time. Go back, I'm, I'm sure Ron and his team offer archives to you and you can see my prior talk on that or you can find me on YouTube or my podcast and learn more about it. But what I wanted to talk to you about today is this technique I've developed called inflation-induced debt destruction. Now, I know that's a mouthful. <laughs> Let's say it 10 times fast. Inflation-induced debt destruction. Inflation-induced debt destruction, right? <laughs> I know, it's, it's a big, long phrase. But it really shows you what is happening behind the scenes, this beautiful, wonderful, absolutely fantastic 
hidden wealth creator that is available to real estate investors. A lot of times they're using it and they don't even realize they're using it. But if they understood it, they could maximize it, they could optimize it, and they could really use it even better. So let's go ahead and dive into some of this today. Now, one of the things we'll be talking about is how to short the US dollar. You know, ever since that whole GameStop thing uh, came out and AMC movie theaters a few months ago with Wall Street bets, you know, you heard a lot about short sellers, right? Tesla was shorted and, and people in the stock market, and I'm not a fan of the stock market by any means, but people in the stock market talk a lot about shorting stocks, right? And when you're shorting a stock, basically you're making a bet that the stock is going to go down in value, that it's overvalued today. And I look at my own portfolio and I own lots of things in my portfolio. I have some Bitcoin and I'm you know, not a huge believer in Bitcoin, although I like to say I hope I'm wrong because I'd love nothing more than to see it succeed. But remember, the two most powerful forces in human history, governments and central banks, they don't like Bitcoin or any other cryptocurrencies because their main product is their currency. It's the dollar. Why would they want competition, right? And they're going to do whatever they can to make sure that cryptocurrencies do not succeed because they need to see their dollar succeed. That's their product. It would be like if you had a store and you sold uh, widgets, right? You know, just the basic economic unit, widgets, right? And you sell these widgets at your store and a competitor opens up across the street from you and they're selling another kind of widget, right? And this is competition for you. If you had the power, you would try to beat your competitor or stop your competitor, right? And that's what the government and the central bank, the Federal Reserve will do and really are doing already with these cryptocurrencies. And Janet Yellen, our new treasury secretary, that was the first thing she said after Biden appointed her. I mean, that was the, literally the first thing she said. We've got to stop Bitcoin basically because it's used for terrorism and drug smuggling and all this kind of stuff, right? Well, you know what's used for that more than anything is US dollars, right? Uh, that That's also used for it. But whatever, the point is, they are going to do whatever they can to stop the cryptocurrencies. But they are also going to do whatever they can to devalue the dollar. Not necessarily because they want to, but because they have to. So I look at my own portfolio and I own a lot of real estate. I own some Bitcoin, I have some stocks, I have cash, I have some gold and silver and precious metals, platinum, palladium, all that stuff. You know, I have a mix of all these things, right? And I think, gosh, I'm long on everything. Should I be worried about that? Should I be shorting something? I mean, I'm basically expecting the value of all those things in my portfolio to increase. But I am big time short on one thing, and that's the US dollar. And I'm going to talk to you today about how I short the dollar and how you can too, in an almost risk-free way. Now, a lot of short sellers get absolutely destroyed in the stock market because when they short a stock and it doesn't work out, when that stock doesn't go down in value, they get just destroyed because they have to pay a big fee for the short. And when, when the stock goes up and it cuts against them, they get wiped out. I mean, billionaires have lost literally all their money, billions and billions of dollars shorting stocks. But if we could do a short on the dollar in a risk-free way, that would be really, really powerful. So let's take a look at that. Okay, so we all probably agree that the government spends too much money. The government is in debt. And I'm not just picking on the US government. This is true of pretty much every government on earth. They're all in this mess. But the US is in a very enviable position because the dollar is the reserve currency of the world. And when you're the reserve currency, you have a whole special bunch of privileges because every country around the world, when they wanna trade internationally, say Saudi Arabia wants to sell their oil, the buyer of their oil has to convert their currency to dollars to buy the oil. That's the rules of the game under what's called the Bretton Woods Agreement, 
that was started back in about 1944. So this agreement to have the dollar as the reserve currency of the world is very, very powerful and gives the U.S. a lot of very special privileges. So we'll go into that. But the U.S. is out of control. They've overspent. They've spent like drunken sailors. And so has Japan. They're really, really bad. Japan is in worse shape than the U.S. But every country has this problem. Every country has big debt problems. So how do they get out of the debt? Well, let's talk about the U.S. specifically. Oh, and by the way, one more thing I want to say to you. Before we consider just the debt, we also need to consider the obligations that the government has already agreed to pay for in the future, the future commitments that aren't even included in the debt. Okay, they're huge. They are absolutely giant, these numbers. All right, so the first thing the government would do is say, look, we're sorry, we've overspent, and we simply do not have enough money to pay for medical care, social security, disability insurance, government workers. We've just got to cut back. We can't keep our promise that we've, that we've made to you, the citizens, the population. We just don't have the money. Sorry, tough luck. That's the way it is. Well, this is very unlikely uh, because uh, it would cause riots in the streets and panic and a lot of civil unrest. And if you don't believe me, just look at what happened in, in Greece when they introduced austerity measures. And Greece is a really good example, but other countries have done it too. Spain, Portugal, Italy, England, you know, all around the world, they're introducing austerity measures to cut back on the benefits. You know, the governments just can't pay them. They just simply don't have the money. And it causes a lot of civil unrest and obviously, whoever's in power at the time a default would happen would be quickly voted out of office, okay? So they want to remain in power. They're not going to default. It's just not very likely. Okay, what's another option for the government? Raise taxes. Well, you know, you've heard the saying, eat the rich, right? We could tax the rich and we could just tax everybody. We could just double taxes. We could triple taxes. We could make the tax rate 100%. Well, guess what? That wouldn't solve the problem because there's simply not enough money available through taxation to ever pay the bill. The debt and the deficit and the future unfunded mandates are so large, you can't pay for them with taxes. The math just won't work at all. I mean, the whole GDP, in other words, the gross domestic product, that the entire country produces every year, the entire economy is just over $20 trillion. Well, the responsibilities are dramatically higher than that. <laughs> I mean, you, could, you couldn't raise tax, if you tax people at 300%, if, if you know, it said work hard all year long and whatever you make, pay the government three times that amount, still not enough money. Okay, the problem is way too big. It's completely out of control. So that won't solve the problem. We could have a yard sale. The U.S. could sell off its assets, right? It could sell the ports, the shipping ports to Dubai. Remember, that was all over the news about eight, 10 years ago, right? Didn't happen, but it was pondered and, you know, would cause some real national security issues. The BLM, the Bureau of Land Management, sells off land, government land, to private developers from time to time. You know, we sell military equipment around the world because we need the money, right? And this is not a good idea because this high-tech military equipment, you know, eventually those friendly countries today, 30 years from now, they become enemies, right? So that's not ideal. These are all things the government does to one degree or another. We could use our military to literally steal the resources of other countries. And if you think this is bad, well, you know, let me just ask you to consider history. The entire history of the world is this, okay? This is just reality. It's, it's not nice, but it is reality. One of the most famous military leaders of all time, Napoleon, was really a military leader with an army so he could steal things. <laughs> you know, that's what he did. He, he said, hey, you know, 
look at all this gold and all these treasures they have. Let's go take them. And we roll over there with the military and just take them. You know, that's an option, right? It's terrible. It's brutal. But it is the history of the world, like it or not. Now, those are all really negative things. Let's talk about something happy and positive. Technological innovation. What if there was some great advancement, some great discovery in biotechnology or nanotechnology or energy science that would be America-centric and would create so much revenue and so much prosperity that it would get us out of the problem. That would be wonderful. Let's hope that happens because that would be great news. But here's the likelihood. The likelihood is inflation because this is a great business plan for the government and for the Federal Reserve, our central bank. Think about it this way. If the government owns owes $1 trillion to China, then if there's 10% inflation, and it doesn't matter how long it takes to have 10% inflation, could be one year, could be two years or three years, right? doesn't matter. But 10% inflation occurs and the government owes a trillion dollars. Well, basically what happens is the government gets to repay the debt, the trillion dollars it owes to China in depreciated dollars. So they just got themselves a 10% discount on the trillion dollars they owe. So in other words, $100 billion in obligations just disappeared. Poof, magic, great deal for the US, great, great deal. And that's why they will continue to find a way to cause inflation on purpose, because the government's plan is the same plan we should be using, right? We should align our interests with these two most powerful forces the world has ever known. How do we really do this? Well, let's first understand what really is happening with monetary policy, with inflation. What are they really doing, right? Okay, so they're devaluing the dollar, they're doing it on purpose, or sometimes just because they need to out of necessity, right? But whatever, it's still on purpose either way. To understand inflation, most people just think of this as, well, rising prices, right? But to really deeply understand it, we need to understand and distinguish the difference between real and nominal. So if I held up a $20 bill in front of you and I asked you to say, what's this? You'd say, hey, Jason, that's a $20 bill. And I'd say, yeah, <laughs> good job. Okay, what if I held up that same $20 bill in front of you, but it was 1980? Well, in 1980, a $20 bill was still called the same thing, a $20 bill. But the value of it was dramatically higher back in 1980 than it is today because of inflation. So we need to distinguish between real and nominal and between price and value. We also need to understand that inflation is a robber and a thief and a pickpocket. It is stealing from us. It is an insidious hidden tax that destroys our lifestyle and destroys our purchasing power. Inflation destroys the value of savings, stocks, bonds, and even equity in real estate. But thankfully, thankfully and wonderfully, it destroys the value of debt. And that's why debt is my favorite four-letter word. <laughs> so inflation destroys the value of debt. Okay, so if you have money in a savings account or a stock account or you own bonds or you have a bunch of equity in your real estate, if inflation comes along, and say there's 10% inflation, it will devalue the value of any of those things by 10%. So say you have a property free and clear, and you have a million dollars in equity, say it's a small apartment or something, right? Or whatever, you have a portfolio of single family homes. I like single family the best. That's what our company helps people buy nationwide is mostly single family homes and some apartments here and there. But say you have a million dollars in equity in your real estate portfolio. Inflation is attacking the value of the equity, even as the price of the property might be rising. So it's one and the other at the same time. But think about it this way. If you had zero equity in that property and you had a 100% loan against the property, 
it would still go up in value by the same amount, whether you own it free and clear, or you have 50% equity or 80% equity or 100% equity, doesn't matter. The price is gonna go up and down with the market, regardless of the amount of equity we have in the property. So I say the thing to do is use leverage in a prudent fashion so that we can take advantage of inflation-induced debt destruction and let inflation destroy the value of our debt. Inflation is the most powerful method to redistribute wealth. You know, most people think it's taxation, but that is amateur hour. Inflation is the real way to redistribute wealth. And just one example of redistribution, well, two examples here. Inflation redistributes wealth from lenders to borrowers. Why is that? Well, because if I borrow money today, I get the present value of those dollars. I get whatever they're worth today. So say I buy a property and I borrow $100,000 to buy it. Well, that $100,000 is at today's value. Now, if 10 years from now, there is 50% inflation over the course of 10 years, which by the way is very possible, then the value of that $100,000 is only 50,000. And so I pay the debt back in cheaper dollars. And that is a beautiful thing. That is inflation-induced debt destruction. So it redistributes wealth from lenders who lose out to borrowers who win by using debt. It also redistributes wealth from old people to young people. Now, mostly people think when someone passes away, they you know leave their estate to somebody else and someone inherits their estate. And that's great. That's an inheritance. That's one way to transfer wealth and redistribute it. But also there's a lot of transfer going on while people are still alive. Why is that? Well, old people hopefully have savings, stocks, bonds, and equity in real estate. Well, young people, unfortunately, but usually have debt. So this redistribution is happening without an inheritance. It's an intergenerational wealth transfer while everybody's alive because the value of what the old people have is getting debased or diminished by inflation. And the value of what young people have, which is usually debt, is also getting devalued or diminished through inflation. All right, so let's look at a very specific example that happened to tens of millions of people. This is not a theory, folks. This happened to tens of millions of people. Now, back in 1971, a very big change happened to not only the United States, but to the entire world. And many of you probably know what I'm gonna say. Richard Nixon, our then president, took us off the gold standard. For many years, from the time of that Bretton Woods agreement that I mentioned earlier, back in 1944, up until 1971, the entire world, all the nations of the world knew that if the United States purchased something from another country and they paid dollars for it, that the other country that sold the goods to the U.S. could always take those dollars it got from the U.S. government and convert them to gold. But in 1971, Richard Nixon said, no more, stop. We're gonna do what's called close the gold window. And in his very famous speech on August 15th of 1971, he said that he was going to temporarily suspend the convertibility of dollars to gold temporarily a half a century ago. <laughs> yes, you can't make this stuff up, folks. That's the temporary suspension. It's been 50 years and it's still, I guess, temporary, right? Sure, Richard, <laughs> we believe you. <laughs> okay, so let's take 1972, just a year after that. This changed the world radically and it created a lot of inflation. And if you look at any housing price chart, you'll see that after we went off the gold standard, housing prices started their meteoric climb for decades and decades. And I think that's gonna continue.
for quite a while to come. And that's really what the other thing, the Hartman Comparison Index does. It helps you understand the value and what what is the future pricing of real estate. But again, that's the prior talk, okay? So let's look at a typical person in 1972 buying a typical house. And let's look at how rich millions and millions of people got from simple home ownership. Now, this is not investing. This is not rental properties. This is just a house they lived in. Watch this. It's absolutely amazing. So if you can see my mouse on the screen, I'm up in the top green part here. Value of 1972 house, the median house price was about $18,000. And if you went to the bank and said, I want to borrow 80%, I want to get an 80% mortgage, I'll put down 20%. You would have borrowed just over $14,000. And the mortgage rate back then was 7.37%. So a lot higher than it is today. And you got a 30-year mortgage. So you start out, and in 1972, a dollar is worth how much? A dollar. No inflation had occurred yet, right? We just bought the property. So a dollar is worth a dollar. And the mortgage payments on this house are $101 per month. You can pull out a calculator, you can amortize that yourself, and you'll find that the payments are 101 per month. Okay, great. So everybody's writing their check for $101 per month to pay the mortgage. That's all well and good. Let's fast forward 12 years. Let's go to 1984, the bottom row on the chart. So by 1984, that 1972 dollar is now only worth 40 cents. So what happens? Well, we're still writing checks for $101 per month. Every month, they got to pay the mortgage, $101. That's still the payment. But guess what? By 1984, the iconic year that George Orwell wrote that great book about 1984 that everybody must read because sadly, it's all becoming true, okay? <laughs> George Orwell's prediction that he made in the 40s about 1984. It's all coming true today for sure. So that payment of $101 per month felt a lot easier by 1984. It felt a lot lighter. In fact, I'll tell you how much it felt. It felt like $41. You see that $101 is now reduced through the magic of inflation to only $41 per month as a mortgage payment. Pretty good right? That is pretty awesome. But wait, there's more as they say. Okay, so let's go to the end. Let's go to where these people make the last payment on their mortgage. So we're going to fast forward to the end. It's now 2001, okay? And they have paid a total of $36,318. 101 per month times 30 years Okay, $36,300. And they borrowed originally just over $14,600, but they thought they were paying 7.37%. But as inflation devalued the payment they were making through inflation induced debt destruction, because inflation devalued the dollar, and guess what? The mortgage, it was denominated in what? dollars, the things that are being devalued. That's wonderful. That's the hidden wealth creator. Okay. So the effective real interest rate they were paying after inflation attacked the value of those dollars was 1.06%. 1.06%. Not 7.37, 1.06. Because in real dollars after inflation, they only repaid 16393 just about $2,000 more than they actually borrowed. Okay, but remember, in the U.S., you have this wonderful benefit that mortgage interest is tax deductible. Now, everybody's in a different tax bracket. I understand that. This is just an example. So on our typical person example here, after inflation, and after taxes, after tax deductions on mortgage interest, they only repaid $12,655. But wait, they borrowed $14,600 and they only repaid $12,600? That's less than they borrowed. 
you're darn tootin'. That's exactly what, what happened. So the effective interest rate after inflation and tax benefits was negative. Yes, negative, below zero, negative 1.16%. So these people, these millions of people, literally got paid to borrow the money. And guess what else they got? They got to live in a house for free for three decades. They got to live there for free. Now, guess what? As an income property investor, like all of us, right? This gets infinitely better because of course we all know we don't pay our own mortgages. We delegate that responsibility. We outsource that responsibility to our tenants. The tenants pay the mortgage. In fact, hopefully the tenants pay us a little extra every month. And we call that positive cash flow. So that is a truly incredible opportunity. Inflation-induced debt destruction really pays us to borrow the money. And it is so multidimensional. Now, most people think they get rich in real estate because the price of the house appreciates. Well, sure. But the real question is, did the house price appreciate or did the dollar depreciate? And the answer is complicated because it depends, right? It always depends. But both are happening at the same time. And that's why people think they get rich. But usually that house price appreciation is only a little bit better than inflation. So if you paid cash for the property, you wouldn't have these benefits. That's why I highly recommend that you leverage your property investments with good quality, three decade long fixed rate loans. Hey, Ron, you're back. Welcome. I am. <laughs> So, um, Jason, everything you just said uh, comes down to buy more real estate and keep it. That's right, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> you got okay. it. You I've, got I've it. heard that message before, and I've yeah. actually even preached it a couple of times. I want to go you one step further. Um, I love the idea of going and getting those big, long mortgages as long as they're in somebody else's name and are not personally guaranteed. Oh yeah, that's that Ron, that yeah. is the best thing. And you know, look at what I'm talking about today is just the, like the general strategy, right? Yeah. You take it a step further and that's why your students love you so much because you take it a step further with even better ways to do it. The only thing I would say about that is hopefully you can get these awesome super low interest rates. Uh, sure. When you do that if it's a subject to deal or whatever. That's but, what you uh, get yeah. today. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. That's what's out there. That's what we get. What a beautiful time to buy and hold real estate. Yeah. <clears throat> For all the reasons that you just described, which some people I am sure do not understand, you know, you, you know that everybody didn't get what you just said, right, Jason? Yeah. Oh, you know, that's why we're here for questions. You know, listen to yeah. my podcast, watch my YouTube channel for yeah. lots more free information on this stuff. You know, you, you need to hear it a few times before it yeah. really sinks in and you realize how incredibly yeah. powerful this stuff is. It really is incredible. And it'll help you understand how important it is to latch on to real estate because there is no other investment like real estate. We do have a few questions, don't we, Nick? Yeah. And, and Ron, by the way, one of the things I like to say uh, to dovetail what you're saying is that income property, income producing real estate is the most historically proven asset class in the entire world. Just yep. nothing beats it because it has these very special multi-dimensional characteristics like you teach yeah. your students, you don't just get return one way, you know, right. buy low, sell high. Sure. That's great. But there's lots of ways you earn your return on investment with you real bet. estate. Yeah. You bet. And regardless of what happens in the economy, people always need a place to live. They sure do. And we've got a mm -hmm. shortage as you well know. Absolutely. Big time. So what you and I are both suggesting, go out and buy like a bat out of hell. <laughs> Stock up. <laughs> You know, <laughs> when you own the resources that the entire world needs, you put yeah. yourself in such a powerful position yep. and everybody needs a place to live. That's right. That's right. Real estate will not fail you. All right, Nick, do we have questions? Um, we just have a lot of uh, chat messages saying thanks for great information. Um, we did have one question from Beverly who maybe didn't understand why. This and is and so Nick, we can't hear you too well. At least I can't. All right, I'll Oh, sorry about that. There you uh, go. He has a turn on my mic. From Beverly, she wants to know why is this so important to us? 
Oh, why is it so important? Because if you're out buying property, you're doing the first thing and that's great, but you've also got to be leveraging your property with these wonderful three decade long fixed rate mortgages at mm -hmm. literally negative interest rates today. I mean, think about this, Beverly. If you borrow money at 3% interest and if inflation is 2%, which it's higher than that, okay, but that's the Federal Reserve's actual target inflation rate, which I'm sure Ron talks about from time to time, at 2%, right? So think about what happens. You borrow at 3%, inflation comes along at a 2% rate, and so now your net interest rate is only 1%. But if you deduct that interest on your taxes, and say your combined state and federal tax rate, depending on what state you live in and how much money you make and all this is just for round numbers, 50%, okay? If you live in the Socialist Republic of California where I used to live, <laughs> um, you're gonna be paying 50% most of the time. So you get to take that 3% and deduct half of it. So you're really only paying 1.5%, 1.5% minus 2% inflation is negative half a percent. Yeah. And that's so, assuming you don't even rent the property out. And get any so the income. answer to your question, Beverly, is it is the beginning of your understanding of how money really works. And if you didn't get it, don't worry about it. Just go buy some properties and one day it'll come. Uh, and you're, you're way ahead. I promise you, you're way ahead of everybody in the country that's not buying properties because they won't they don't get it either. Yeah. <laughs> but just forget everything Jason just said and go buy a bunch of properties. <laughs> there you and go. See what happens. <laughs> one day you wake up filthy, stinking rich. Yep. Okay. All right. Well, Jason, um, I don't have any more questions for you. I certainly appreciate your participation as always. Good stuff. And um, you're always a pleasure to have on here. You're just a wealth of information. Yeah. Thank you, so, Ron. Thank you. It's always a pleasure to be here. And I, I love talking to your students because uh, they, they get it. They understand, you know, and it's just always great to be talking with good people who understand the importance of income property, not mm -hmm. only the property itself, but the mortgages on the property, the hidden asset. Mm -hmm. The money gain. Yep. You got it. Okay. Well, thank you, sir. All right. Appreciate thank you. you. Happy okay. investing, everybody.